What I'm going to talk about today is the, the main title is learning differences in anxiety, but anxiety is such a broad area and it's something that I don't think that we're great at fully understanding. And some of the research that we're doing that I'll tell you about at the end is trying to help us be able to do that better. But um, I, I do have, when I said I do clinical trials, I have research money from all those places, but I'm not planning to promote any research or tell you about anything that relates to that. What I'd like to do today is to give you an overview of learning, reading, and emotional disorders. It's kind of a quick thing to do in just about an hour. I want to talk about some of the socio-emotional impacts of learning and reading disorders, talk about anxiety, ADHD, and other comorbid disorders, talk about interventions and treatment, and then tell you some about the UCSF Dyslexia Center. It's really brief, but it'll give you a flavor of what it is that we're trying to do, and hopefully it'll tie in to all the things that I'm raising as questions and things that we're struggling to know more about. What this busy slide says is that I think too often educational settings overlook the emotional parts of learning and reading. They don't do it intentionally, but it's not fully the way they were trained to think and to look at things. So when you say, gee, I think that kid's really anxious, they say, well, yeah, he's really anxious, but it's not like that's a target for their intervention. Or the same with other disorders that we'll talk about. But the other side of that, I'm afraid, becomes true as well. When someone goes to see a mental health professional and they're there because they're anxious or they're having trouble with depression or they're having trouble with attention, that mental health professional doesn't think often enough about, I wonder if there are some learning difficulties that this person has and how can we put those things together? In part, because we're in different universes. Education people came up through one way of learning and being educated and mental health and medical people came up from another way and we don't put those together. And even when we do put them together, we sometimes do it like it was a Venn diagram that they're separate. So there's this over here and there's this over there, rather than these things that we're talking about are all intertwined and work together. And to get the best outcomes, to do the very best, and the best schools, I think, tease that apart, like um, Sand Hill School and Armstrong and, and lots of others that, that we're increasingly working with. But then I think kids go to those places and feel, ah, I'm understood. Or somebody helps get me in a certain way that they didn't in public schools. So our goal is to try and make that both sides work better and go back and forth in the way that it might happen. We're talking about learning disorders. About 30 to 50 percent of the population has diagnosed or undiagnosed learning difficulties and challenges. 20 percent of, 7 percent of children with learning disabilities drop out of high school. And about a third of children who have a learning disorder also have, co have ADHD that goes along with it. So we're seeing that this affects a large part of the population. It often goes unrecognized, and it goes so it's not fully treated. And not because of bad intentions, but because of a lack of overlapping education. So when we think about how could something like dyslexia get started with difficulties with phonology, which is the kind of classic definition, we know that it really involves a whole bunch of other things like auditory processing or visual processing and recognition, recognition of word forms. Then it can have to do with executive function and attention and uh, working memory kinds of things that, have, that feed into that and then sensory motor issues that become part of it. So reading and writing is complex not only in that it involves different brain areas needing to work together, but it also involves different processes that can have a way of extending into anxiety, can extend into uh, uh, attention and other kinds of issues. And then when we go out another layer, then we're into socio-emotional issues to uh, things like math, and, uh, and how you work with numbers. And then we begin to think about those things that co-occur like auditory processing disorders, nonverbal learning disability. 
even to some extent autism, but we'll talk about that in a minute because it's not truly a clear overlap, but there are ways that it becomes a confusing one around learning, <clears throat> and then ADHD and dyspraxia, dysgraphia, sensory processing. And then when we think about what other disorders might be overlapping with this, there um, is a way with ADHD, autism, and as I'd mentioned with autism, there can be an auditory discrimination problem with people who have learning disorders and in people who have autism. And it can make it seem as though people who have autism might have a learning disorder like dyslexia, but when it comes down to it, it's not quite the same disorder. But there still may be things that could benefit that person with autism who's having a difficult time learning to read or with auditory processing. There's other uh, speech and language disorders. Conduct disorder and ODD aren't part of a core part of it, but if you go unrecognized, for your learning disorder and the anxiety and other things that you have as part of it, or that's not appreciated and taken into account, you become increasingly peripheralized, kind of pushed to the outside of the in-group. And as you get pushed to that outside of the in-group, you're more likely to get into some kind of difficulty or trouble. People have looked in the in the juvenile justice population, in the prison population, and would say conservatively, 50 to 70 percent of those people have unrecognized, often unrecognized learning disorders. And they didn't get there because that's what they had. They got there because it wasn't recognized. And then they got pushed out, and they didn't fit, and they didn't feel good about themselves. And there may be other things that they could do well, because they're smart, or have some good skills, but but there were other things that got in the way. And anxiety is the one that's the topic for today, but it's this ubiquitous kind of thing. When I talk to people that work in centers for folks that have learning disorders, they tell me, you know, anxiety is the thing that just often we don't know fully how to work with, what we can do with it, and parents come and tell me the same thing. How can we make that better? And I'll talk some about it, but I don't think we got the final answer yet. We're studying, and we're trying to learn more, and I hope that we come up with better answers as we move along. And that anxiety can lead into depression, and that can be a lifelong kind of difficulty or challenge or struggle. So when we talk about learning and mental disorders and the, the, what some people call comorbid, but I'd like to call intersecting or blended, then we're talking about people with LD have more depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms. They're more likely to uh, attempt and commit suicide. They can be aggressive and have delinquent behaviors. They're 200% more likely to be arrested. 36% of those with LD, mostly poor readers, receive some kind of counseling or psychotherapy for low self-esteem and social isolation. And that's something that continues on through college. So a study that one of the, we have three main uh, labs in our group. There is, uh, and I'll tell you about Mary Lou Gorner Tempini, who is a neurologist and does our phenotyping part of what we do. Fumiko Haft, who does our apps and does the socio-emotional learning. And what I do is measuring outcomes and trying to see, can we work with schools both to design instruments that they find useful, but have gold standard instruments as well. But this is a study from Fumiko's lab looking at socio-emotional issues. And she looked at students who had learning disorders and students who didn't, that you know were control groups. And looking at things like higher anxiety, you can see the difference between the two. Higher depression, you can see the difference. Sense of a lower sense of mastery and a lower growth mindset. Growth mindset refers to feeling a kind of positiveness about how things are going to go. I know I can learn this, or I know this, things are going to get better, or I know that I can get this down, is a good growth mindset. But sometimes people unwittingly give folks with learning disorders or they developed on their own a, non, a lower growth mindset of saying, oh, I'll never get this. I'll never be able to do this. And they say that to themselves repeatedly. 
So people with LD experienced anxiety in situations where they worry they'll make a mistake or be ridiculed, like the child that gets called up to say, can you read in front of the class? Um, a, a few years ago here, Gavin Newsom, who's our honorary board chair, told the story of how he'd work at night to memorize what he was going to have to read the next day, and then he acted like he was actually reading it, but it was only because of his memory. The stress uh, response is something, at, at a certain level, is good for us. If we don't have any stress and we don't have any anxiety, we're kind of blobs. We don't do anything. We don't get out and make an effort. But if we have too much, it pushes us over the top. It makes us feel so we avoid situations. We don't do as well. But that stress response affects not only us psychologically, but it affects our body as well. And we'll tell you about some physiology studies that we've done to look at that. And then the more we feel we can't control the situation or the outcome, the more anxiety we feel. And it eventually leads into freezing. And I think on the next slide, there becomes an anticipation of failure. That raises anxiety. Frustration uh, leads to anger. And sometimes parents are the ones that are the likely recipients of that. It's harder to really kind of lose it and get upset at school. So the kid holds it together and then comes home and relaxes. And I found too often that all of us as mental health professionals say, aha, that means there's something really bad going on at home. They come home and they fall apart. And they held it, to, they did fine at school with the structure and the compassion and the fresh teacher. And yet they get home and something doesn't work when in fact it may often be that they come home and they finally can let down and there's somebody in a way that they can take it out on and that becomes apparent that makes it especially challenging. So this self-esteem challenge leads to negative thoughts and can lead to depression and all of this can lead to family stress and a kind of spiral that leads down into more anxiety and depression for everyone. When we think about reading disorders and depression, uh, there's an increase in internalizing, meaning you turn that anger inside, uh, anxious and depressive symptoms with dyslexia. And the severity depends on comorbidity with things like ADHD, perceived social support, and it seems harder for girls that they have a harder time and are more likely to get into the depression. Some people say, well, maybe boys are more likely to get into conduct disorder or externalizing acting out behaviors. And there's a difference in the way that they express those. Um, compared to college students without reading disorders, the, those with are five times more likely to have clinically significant test anxiety. And general anxiety is higher, too. And I'll tell you about a study on that in just a few minutes. Interestingly, as people try and study families, both genetically and the way that they tend to operate, there may be, even within families, a greater propensity towards anxiety than, say, in families that don't have somebody with dyslexia. So in that way, it gets woven in even from generations. Now, some of it might happen just because a parent's worried about their child, and that makes them anxious as they go through that worry. But there are studies that suggest that perhaps there's this heightened ability to get anxious uh, that seems to run genetically through families that may have kids then with learning disorders. So what does it look like when people feel anxious? I think we all know, but people are hypervigilant. They're watching carefully for that situation where they might be humiliated, where they might feel bad. They're reactive to novel stimuli. They don't like to go to a situation where they don't know what's going to happen. They feel anxious about that situation that is new and that they can't fully predict. So they avoid it. They say, I'm sick today. I can't go to school. Or I don't want to go to that party because I don't know what's going to happen there. And I might feel a loss of control and that I'm not doing very well. Well-intentioned parents 
might react to that by accommodating. They want to protect their child. They say, that's OK. You don't have to go to school today. Or that's OK. You don't need to go do this social situation. And I know that's easier said than done, but the way that one begins to try and help negotiate that bridge and make that happen is something that becomes important because once it starts in that direction, it's awfully hard to pull it back. So when a kid isn't going to school and is saying that they have stomach problems or a headache or other things like that, then it often leads into million dollar workups that are negative and then you're still left with that problem. So it, it helps to be compassionate and understanding and we'll talk some about that as we get into interventions. But there's this way of saying how might parents help without accommodating or over, prote over protection. All of these anxiety things can lead to inattention and poor performance at school. Did any of you go to Glenn Elliott's workshop this morning? I saw that it was listed, oh good, as um, you know, talking about the uh, way that inattention, ADHD, and reading disorders are so intertwined. It's often a challenge to tease them apart and figure out how to work with them. But I think at Sand Hill they're doing that and we're doing that in our research as well, trying to then be able to better target uh, how kids are doing. This anxiety may become most noticeable between 6 and 12, but it has a lifetime prevalence between 4 and 27 percent. Other symptoms include uh, emotional processing that can be difficult. So misassumptions, you know, thinking that some, something, somebody was saying something bad or that the situation was bad, misinterpreting and doing that quickly, that lends itself to what we'll talk about later in terms of interventions to then trying to work with kids not saying you're wrong or that's not the way it was, but it's more saying, is there another way you could look at that? Do you think you could think of another explanation as you go through that assumption that you just made about what other people are thinking or feeling? It can also lead to explosive outbursts when they get overwhelmed and they have a meltdown. The kids uh, can be sensitive, easily tearful, f uh, fear and having preoccupation with things like death and dying, and you hear kids say that, and it really leads to great concern from parents that say, oh my gosh, is my kid suicidal? I think usually greater questioning leads to them saying, no, I just wish there was a way that this would stop. I wish that this anxiety didn't have to go on. It's not that I want to off myself, but how can I make it stop? How can I make it go away? And, and then we talked about avoidance. Um, there's a neurobiologic basis from that, and one of the people in our group that's in neurology, Virginia Strum, has a study that I think I've listed it there as published. It's a revise and resubmit, and uh, it's, so it's not quite published yet, but it's was a study to look at kids with, who have dyslexia and look at emotional reactivity uh, a, a, along with kids who are controls and looking at things like expressions on people's faces, um, looking at then their autonomic reactivity, the subject, subjective experience and the way that comes out in different brain areas and finds that viewing these emotional film clips Children with dyslexia exhibited greater facial behavior, more autonomic reactivity, like their blood pressure goes up, their heart rate goes faster, uh, and, and a, even a, a change in their gray matter volume in their brain. Uh, and it's predominantly right hemisphere, whereas dyslexia, for most people, is predominantly left hemisphere. This emotional reactivity is more right hemisphere. And the findings suggest a neurobiologic basis for this heightened emotional reactivity in kids that, um, that, that have dyslexia that seems physiologically based and also even based in the way their brain becomes wired and structured. Another study by Famico was looking at anxiety and attentional bias. So attentional bias refers to attention to threat. So it could be either hypervigilance or it could be avoidance. So you see this threat, you kind of are worried and you feel anxious by it. You either become hypervigilant and pay really close attention 
or you kind of fog it out. You block it and act like it's not there, or you pull away from it and don't go through it. So she did this study looking at different kinds of word clusters, uh, looking at three different word clusters that had different meanings. One was look at word clusters that was like physical threat, things like a bomb or war or murder, or a social stereotype like dumb or disabled, or academic or a reading threat like the words book or, th or read or write. And what was interesting in this study with these kids was that for physical threat, there was no difference between the two groups, the group that were the typically reading kids and the kids with, with learning disorder. For even the stereotype threat, dumb, disabled, slow, no difference. But for academic words like book or reading, uh, there was a significant difference at a .03 level that suggests the anxiety isn't only that. It's not just that you hear those words that are associated with reading. You may be more prone towards anxiety, but when you get those cues, when you feel like, oh gosh, I've got to take an exam, I've got to stand up in front of the class and read something, I've got to do these other things that are those feared situations, these kids go up in terms of their, um, uh, their focus and attention on those things and how they happen. So it's a significant group difference between the three groups. And then tools to cope with academic struggles then may be important for addre addressing this attentional bias and anxiety that happens. The course of anxiety is that about 20% of kids with LD have a significant amount of anxiety, enough to call it an anxiety disorder, and about 20% go on to develop depressive disorder. So total of 40, it would be 40 with anxiety, but 20 just anxiety, 20 more go to uh, depression. The childhood onset has a high risk of progressing to depression. The intense symptoms may diminish, but the emotional symptoms seem to continue on in a more internalizing way, not in a way that's as obvious. And it's bi-directional. So Kid feels anxious, the learning situation raises their anxiety, they don't perform well, they feel more anxious, and it keeps going back and forth and back and forth. And these symptoms and failure in major roles may come even more in adulthood and continue on with a certain mindset that even though they're not having to take exams in class or learn, that anticipation of, of failure or a way of seeing things or framing them become difficult. So the kinds of anxiety disorders that we might see when people are feeling anxious, separation anxiety disorder, kids refuse to go to school because they want to stay home with a primary caretaker. It's not that they're just refusing to go to school, it's that they, they feel anxiety when they separate from a primary caretaker. Generalized anxiety disorder is generally the kid that's biting his nails way down, feels anxious, worried, thinking about tests, thinking about what's, what are we having for dinner tonight, you know, what time are we going to the grocery store, uh, feeling upset when things don't work the way because they feel more anxious when they can't predict things. Social anxiety disorder, worried about being in social situations, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress and panic disorder, I don't think I need to explain. There's some screeners that you can use. You know, if you're thinking about, I wonder if my kid has too much anxiety, or even if you're a teacher and you're thinking, I wonder how I could just engage in a conversation with parents about whether this might be a difficulty. Not trying to make a diagnosis based on a screening instrument, but trying to say, how do I ask the right questions? How do I, or say one spouse is saying, no, no, it's not a problem. The other spouse is saying, yeah, yeah, it is a problem. Well, then you pull the this, this scale out and you discuss it. What do you think about each of these different things? So the mask is one that we use a lot in research, but you have to pay to get the mask. But it's one that you see often reported in studies. But this scared, the screen for uh, child anxiety-related emotional disorders, you can get online. You'll, if you just uh, Google that, that, you'll find that you pit scared will give you that, that rating scale. 
Then there's also an Achenbach behavior checklist, and there are several others like the Basque, but all of those you need to pay and then they get scored. But sometimes we give them to parents to say, why don't you go home and talk about these and see whether you think they're an issue. But if you want to do it without going to a center that gives you the scales that they have, then the scared's available. Um, so then when we think about LD and ADHD, and as I think Dr. Elliott's talk or workshop was pointing out, it's often difficult to separate these things, that you see a certain amount of anxiety and ADHD and RD that are all kind of working together and learning differences. But again, with ADHD, the learning disorders are often overlooked and undertreated. There's a high degree of overlap in genetic, neuropsychological, and brain differences between people that have reading disorders and have ADHD. The number of similarities, not for every single person, but for subgroups. And 15 to 45 percent of children with ADHD, particularly the inattentive type, also have reading disorder. And 20 to 40 percent of those with reading disorder also have ADHD. So the results in academic underachievement. The inattentive is most common in reading disorders, and inattentive is also most common in girls. Boys are more likely to have the impulsive, hyperactive type thrown in, in addition to the inattentive type. And they share a, cogni a common cognitive deficit in processing speed, suggesting that common genes might be involved. So when we see people that have ADHD, they often have deficits in processing speed. We see kids with, with reading disorder, they do as well. Not every one, but there's a kind of linkage that makes us think they might be going together. So in thinking about ADHD, and I think some of the speakers here have emphasized this, there are some good things about ADHD. There's a sense of being a scanner uh, and being able to look at a broader sense of things. Some people have said that ADHD worked well, if we think about it anthropologically, for people that are hunters. You're out, you're trying to look over the vista, the see are there animals moving, you're, you're kind of screening. But if you're a farmer, it's not good if you can't keep your focus on <laughs> growing those crops. So ADHD wasn't a good one. But if you think about those people that you know, have ADHD, that scanning focus works. I have some people that are skiers and say it really works well for them skiing. But we also do avows for NFL football players in order for them to be able to take their stimulant medication, you know, to get permission to do that. And some of the players tell me, that they don't like to take the medication on a game day, their backs mainly, because they're saying they don't want to focus on any one thing. They want to look at the whole field and be scanning. But when they need to learn new plays, they want to take the medication, because that helps them pay attention and focus. It's not 100% that. I have some of them tell me, no, I want to take it on the game day too, because I might just be spaced out and, and you know miss what's happening. It's also a thing, if you're thinking about playing the outfield, and you have have ADHD. I mean, you know, <laughs> it just, you know, it's not a good one. You need to be able to focus better. This, that scanning focus is not as good, especially if you're spaced out. But some people with ADHD develop a way of kind of hyper-focusing. They don't do that naturally, but I think it's a way that they do to overcome the ADHD, where they can screen out everything, and it's like, mm, you know, I'm not going to listen to any of these other things. I'm just going to focus on this thing that's right in front of me. It can be exhausting for them, but they really bring everything into focus, and they can do very very well, and, and they do very well, and they like it. They like getting into that state, although it can be exhausting. There's a resilience and commitment that I think people with ADHD learn to have, and ingenuity. They're willing to take risks, and they have spontaneity. They can be funny because they're quick in thinking about things. They have an idea that anything is possible. They're persistent because they've got to be if they're going to get ahead. And they have a different perspective. They're often really good motivational speakers. If you all heard Gavin Newsom when he was here, you know, he's great, you know. And, and you have other people that can shift and move and focus quickly. If you think about some of those people that did it well, people think of Albert Einstein, Michael Phelps, 
that you, these may not all be people that you have on your hit club list, or you know, these are my favorite people. I want to be like them, like maybe Cher or Paris Hilton. But Walt Disney had ADHD. Richard Branson, you know, of uh, Virgin Airlines, also has dyslexia. Michael Jordan, Justin Timberlake. So there's a variety of people that have done very, very well. They often are very smart. You know, it helps when you have dyslexia and you're very smart, or if you have ADHD and you're very smart. It's harder if you're average intelligence and you have those things. It, it, you have to work harder to overcome that. So ADHD, as you all know, is two main things, at least in DSM-5. It used to be three in DSM-4, but now it's inattention and impulsivity and hyperactivity. So we have the predominantly inattentive type, which as I said is more common in dyslexia and more common in girls. There's the combined type and then there's more the predominantly hyperactive impulsive type, which is the least common of them all. We're talking about distractible inattention. We're saying that people have trouble maintaining their focus. Sometimes parents will come in to me and say, you know, I'm, my child has attention deficit disorder and I'd like you to evaluate them for that. And I say, really, you know, can you tell me about it? And they say, well, you know, if I'm fixing dinner and he's in watching TV and then I call Johnny and I say, Johnny, come in and have dinner, he doesn't listen to me. And I holler three or four times and he doesn't listen to me. And finally I walk in, grab him by his chin, pull his head up and say, it's time to come and eat. And he goes, oh, okay. And he comes in and he, and he eats. Well, that's difficulty shifting sets in attention. It's not distractible in attention. A kid with distractible in attention, mom would call. He'd hear, but he'd get up and see his Game Boy and start playing that. Then he'd forget she called. Then he'd go back and watch TV, and she'd call again. Then he'd look out the window, and he'd see that his friend was out there playing. And pretty soon he'd forget, and he'd be back watching TV again. So that's a distractible inattention, but it's not that you couldn't get him to shift sets. So it's important when we think about that when we're saying, what's ADHD, and what is difficulty shifting sets, which may go along a little bit with anxiety or OCD type behaviors. There can be impacts on a lot of things throughout the whole lifetime. For children, there can be academic limitations, there can be trouble with relationships. If you don't pay attention to how somebody is looking at you, it's hard to really form relationships. If you're distracted and looking off, I, I know some wives say that husbands do that all the time, so they all have ADHD, <laughs> but I think it's, uh, Maybe they're more prone to that. Um, but there are things that uh, keep going, too, that even as you get into adolescence, they're more likely to have motor vehicle accidents. They get distracted if they're not taking their medications. They're more likely to have injuries. They can be, in some ways, more likely to get into smoking or substance abuse, not because ADHD is a risk factor, but they, again, can get peripheralized. They, again, can try to self-medicate and, and, in some ways, treat their anxiety. So study, there's been controversy about is there more substance abuse among people that are taking stimulant medication for ADHD? And most of the literature says no, but there are a few studies that say yes. And when people have tried to break that down by saying, are these people that are well treated for their ADHD or are they just people that at one point or another in their life have been treated for ADHD? The studies, at least for the most part, are saying it's people that are well treated don't seem to have trouble with uh, substance use. Rating scales, again, that you can get online. The ADHD rating scale is the one that we use the most in studies. If you just Google ADHD rating scale, you can get that. It doesn't give you the score sheet easily, but you can dig back in and find a score sheet. The Connors costs money. The Vanderbilt doesn't, and that's another one that you can get. And it's the Vanderbilt that we're using primarily in our outcome studies because it doesn't have too many items, and it's quick for people to fill out. But when a family first comes in and says, I wonder about ADHD, I usually suggest that they sit down and talk about, you know, what do you think about this in, in their child? We think about anxiety disorders treatment. There's a way that I alluded to before is you work, is there a way to positively reframe things? And if you think about cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, the effort is to 
to use that cognitive reframe. Could you see this another way? Could there's, is there another explanation? Even if they say that's not right, you just want to engage them in saying, well, you know, come up with one other explanation. It doesn't need to be right. Just tell me, you know, you've made an assumption about what's right. Can you think of another? In that way, you're kind of challenging that thought and saying, could we then think of it differently? And could you even at some point begin to learn to do that when you get into a situation that makes you anxious? Could you challenge that assumption with another thought and see, could you do that? And I think, you know, when we're all coping well, we do that. We start off, you know, something happens, it upsets you, you feel bad, and you think either I'm really a creep or that other person's really a creep. And you get stuck on that, and then as you work at it for a while, you begin to say, maybe there's an assumption in there that's wrong, and maybe things could be seen differently. So that's what leads into CBT, and that's kind of what is involved. And you can find some self-help books on CBT. It often helps to have a coach or a therapist that asks you to do homework and fill out uh, things that say, what was your thinking? What were alternative ways of thinking? But it's, it's, it's part psychoeducation. There's a functional assessment about what you're thinking. How do you make those assumptions? There's exposure to new ways of thinking, new ways of dealing and coping with things. And it's often helpful to have the whole family be involved in this, that in some ways, everybody is thinking about, could we challenge these assumptions? It also leads families to not just tell the kid they're wrong. Uh, you know, you shouldn't feel that way. He said, well, yeah, but that's the way I feel. Or you shouldn't be thinking that way. That's not the right thing. Well, that's what I'm thinking. So how do the family gets involved and not give this edict that this is the way it is? Rather, it's, can you engage in a dialogue with me about how is this going? And then the parents become a coach in that way of trying to think about these other things. So then people can prepare for one of those stressful situations, a birthday party, uh, something that's happening at, at uh, school or a, a situation. OK, what do you think is going to happen? Well, you know, it's that everybody's going to laugh at me. Well, what if we thought about it another way, doing those kinds of exercises in the CBT? There's a de-stress model that talks about this lack of understanding results in self-blame and self-doubt. This website lists uh, these, and all of my slides, I think, are available online. But the th define, so you define what's the issue, what are you thinking here? And often, you know, what they're thinking about is not at all the reality of what things are. Then you educate, then you speculate about other things, then you teach about alternative ways of dealing with it. You try and find things that reduce the stress. Can you think about another way that this could turn out? Could you imagine something else? Then you ask them to practice it. You do it together. It's kind of an exercise. And then you note their success with lots of praise. Great. That was so good. And they come home and tell you about these things. And so you put this positive reframe about it, and then you strategize for the next time. Other things, though, can be yoga. There's lots of yoga here today. And there's, <laughs> I, I noticed the people out on the mats and doing that, uh, all of that. And I, I think people are appreciating more and more mindfulness meditation uh, has become an important part of what we do. Biofeedback, we'll talk a bit about that. It's, uh, it, some people think it's made a big difference for them. Some studies say it doesn't seem to last long term. But it is learning in a way to meditate, and it is learning to get that relaxation response. And then, of course, exercise. I just think of so many times uh, medical students will come in and we'll talk. And what they do when they have a big exam is go out for a long run, or when they've had a bad thing happen. And I think many of us do say, what can I do, rather than drink a double score. Scotch, I think I'll go to the gym and, and exercise, and I'll feel better afterwards. So it makes a huge difference. Then there are kind of behavioral interventions that you can work with your teachers to help, or teachers can think about and work with having either that they recommend or that they, if it helps, 
could have the child's doctor recommend, but you know things like practice appropriate ver verbal exchanges, remove the students from the situation until control is achieved. Some this one school for kids with autism in San Anselmo that we were mentioning, Oak Hill School, is in a beautiful setting that has hills all around it, and there's a large playing field out there. And so when the kid just starts to lose it in the class, the teacher says, all right, head out to the field, or why don't you go walk around the periphery? And I think you do that at Armstrong too, don't you? And say, and I think, you know, all of you can see those situations, but rather than power through it, it's like, you know, let's change the scene. Let's let's kind of go out and and uh, and Sandhill has that obviously too. It helps to have room around your school where you can do that and get out. So then you can think about seating arrangements um, and how that works best. I had a I had a real difficult time learning to read when I was little, and my second grade teacher put me in the very back of the class so that she could come up and look at how bad my handwriting was and how I wasn't reading well. And then she'd pick me up by the ear and slap me across the head and tell me I was lazy. So that's one of the seating arrangements that you don't really want to, to think about. You want to have the kid, can they be in the front? Can you? It's not so you can pick on them better, it's so you can notice them more. Uh, you establish a model and you rehearse the classroom rules. Here's what we do, here's what we're going to do if this happens. So you've set the rules up ahead of time and it's not like you're just all of a sudden enforcing them. Then you remove people from potentially frustrating stimuli, teach ways to deal with frustration, teach thinking before action, teach perspective taking, provide immediate social reinforcement, and limit consequences. Sometimes parents will say, what you did was really bad, you're grounded for a month. Kids just don't think in terms of a month. You know, it's not a meaningful grounding. So after a few days, it doesn't matter anymore. So it helps to try and say, uh, what's a meaningful thing that you could lose? Is it, you know, access to your iPad, or is it we're not going to the movie this weekend, or something that is a short-term thing rather than a long-term one? And then you can think of other ways of modifying an accommodation, that uh, extending time for assignments, reducing the volume of assignments, breaking long assignments into smaller chunks, allowing breaks to recharge as we talked, extending time for test taking or breakup, providing study outlines, speaking in short, simple, positively phrased sentences, sentences and restating the response. So you say it back more than one time. It's important in thinking about, I'm going to talk briefly about pharmacologic treatment. And if we get to the discussion, Q&A, you want to talk more about that, that's fine with me or afterwards. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time, even though a lot of what I do are meds and nutritional kinds of things. But it's important that those meds be integrated into a full treatment package. It's not enough to just give the med and that's it. It's talking about psychoeducation for the parents and family. What can they read? How can they understand what you're doing? It's thinking about cognitive behavioral approaches and treatment, uh, referring someone to a therapist at least for a brief time until it's felt that's not necessary. Although sometimes I'll try medication first and see how much progress do we make with the medication and then decide how much more do, might they need for the therapy. But often parents come in and say, no, no, not the medication, anything but the medication. So I say, well, why don't you try therapy for three months and let's make an appointment for you to come back and see, are things better? Are things going better now? Or do you want to, and, and often they come back and say, well, the therapy has been okay. He doesn't like going there. It's a big struggle. but." it's not enough to improve this. Or other times, they don't come back, I think, in part because, yeah, it helped and the, those things worked. So for anxiety, we primarily use SSRI-type medications. Those SSRI-type medications were studied, and there was just recently a review, like in the past two to three months, talking about what medications work best for anxiety in kids who have anxiety, and it's these selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. There are other kinds of antidepressants called SNRIs, selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, but the SSRIs are 
the ones like Prozac, Luvox, Zoloft, Paxil, Celexa, Lexapro, and the SNRIs are ones like Cymbalta and Effexor. And sometimes we move to those last two when we've tried SSRIs and kids can get activated. It's a small number, maybe five to 10%. Feel an inner restlessness and can feel like they're gonna jump out of their skin with SSRIs. It's a little more likely with people that might have some neurodevelopmental differences. And some people say it's a little more likely in people that might be prone towards bipolar but it's not diagnostic of bipolar if it happens, but it often means that you need to be cautious with SSRIs. It goes away when you stop, but you can't just keep pushing it on up. For stimulants, there are two main groups. There's the, the methylphenidate group and the dextroamphetamine group, and everything is that. It's how, the only difference is how long do they last. So Ritalin, regular Ritalin lasts three to four hours. Regular dextro, dextroamphetamine or dextrostrat lasts three to four hours. Um, Adderall, which is the dextroamphetamine, lasts about eight hours. Adderall XR lasts about 10 to 12 hours. Vivance on that same side lasts about 12 hours. On the methylphenidate side, there's ones like methylene, metadate, there are eight to 10 hours. Concerta is about 12 hours. There's a patch, there's a liquid form now that can last up to 12 hours. The patch lasts as long as you've got it on, but you're not supposed to wear it all the time. That can cause a skin rash and other things. So there are new things coming out, and I know this is a real quick review of it, but um, it, just to say that there are these stimulant-type medications, but then we also use others like Stratera. I don't think I have that on this slide. That um, is a SNRI. It works more on norepinephrine, whereas stimulants work more on dopamine. And. Uh, there's another one, Wellbutrin, that works a little bit on, uh, on dopamine, and we don't use those usually first line, but we do use them, especially if there are side effects. They're also not controlled substances, and all of these are where you have to have a monthly prescription written out hard copy. There are unproven treatments, which doesn't mean they don't work. It just means they haven't been studied enough to say with great confidence that they do. So EEG biofeedback training, there's getting to be a growing literature that suggests maybe this helps. But the reviews of all the studies have for the most part said, doesn't, the active isn't better than the control. And it costs a fair amount of money and takes a fair amount of time. But increasingly, there are good studies coming out saying that it benefits people and it may be a particular subgroup of people. And, it's, and it lasts and it's done without medication. Dietary manipulation, again, hasn't been shown to play a factor, but I sure know lots of parents that tell me their kid really gets affected when they get into the sugar. The day after Halloween can be a bad day, the day that they uh, use a lot of refined sugars. But people say that's so for all of us, for everybody that eats too much of those refined sugars. Megavitamin therapy has been studied, but hasn't fully been shown to be a benefit, herbal treatments, manipulation, sensory integration training, anti-yeast medications, supplements, and micronutrients have all some small case series that suggest they work. And I've heard parents that I deeply respect tell me some of those things made a big difference for their kids. But if you say, show me the study, is there a good study that shows in a blinded fashion that this really made a difference? There just aren't the studies that have been done yet. What's hard is most of these are things that aren't supported by a drug company and a patent. So for drugs that are, then those drug companies can mount the kind of very expensive studies that it takes to do these things well, and others can't. Even the federal government might pay some, but not enough. So the other part of thinking about promoting resilience and success, again, from a FAMICO uh, socio-emotional kind of basis or point of view. She looks at social support in the way that it leads to connection. 
the strength-based approach, praising people's strengths, leading to their confidence, reducing this stereotype threat, oh, I have a learning disorder, I'm not going to do well, oh, I have trouble with this or that. There's a way of reframing it, and I think many of the schools that are really highly successful, like Armstrong and Sand Hill, do that reframing approach. These kids come out saying, hmm, I'm good, I got a learning disorder, you know, or I've got something special about the way I view the world and see things, and I think it's great. Then positive reframing and reappraisal, what we've been talking about that leads to more resilience, a growth mindset, a sense of optimism are all things that lead into promoting um, uh, a, a whole school environment that works better. And that there are things on each side of this equation that look at the internal things that we just went through, family factors, peers in school, but then on this other side that are looking at cognitive and protective factors like oral language skills, motor skills, morphological awareness, all of those that lead to um, this cognitive protective factors, socio-emotional protective factors, less severe learning disorders, and then a positive outcome. Um, and I think I'm just on my last few slides. That um, again, a Fumiko study in her group looked at. Uh, intervention in school-based programs where you have a near peer, you have somebody that's a coach, like um, there are a number of programs here that are ex exhibiting and talking about using a peer model. Sometimes it's a, uh, an older peer that also has a learning disorder. Sometimes it's somebody that doesn't have a learning disorder but is kind of like a pal or a peer for people. And that those uh, seem to improve how kids are doing and in the study they found that that um, after participating in the mentoring programs students with learning disorder show more comfort with their learning disorder and it decreases their emotional reactivity being in this peer type group and doing those leads to better self-esteem and it Self-esteem is high if you're comfortable with your LD, even if you have poor emotional regulation. But if you have good emotional regulation, it, it, it helps even if you have low comfort with your LD. So both of those things together, obviously, are the best. But either one alone can be very helpful. So I did say that was the last, but I have about four or five slides to tell you about our dyslexia center. And I, we go till 145, right? Uh, and uh, if, if you want to get up and leave now, that's OK. I'm just going to tell you a little about our dyslexia center. And our vision is to demonstrate more clearly how neuroscience research can impact education with a focus on more personalized learning, saying all dyslexia is not the same. All attention difficulties are not the same. How can we subtype that based on neuroscience research? Uh, and elucidate the neurobiology and neural circuitry associated with these learning difficulties and thinking functions. So our team, I had mentioned our um, Mary Lou, who does, is a neurologist and does the phenotyping. Fumiko, who's uh, an MD, PhD, I'm sorry that got left off, who does some of the studies I've talked about. You'll, maybe recognize some people in the front row, but um, these are people from our team, from throughout our team working together. And one of the things that we think is really unique and special is the way that we bring neurology and psychiatry together to do this. I find Mary Lou is often talking about the cognitive circuit that's involved and the way this kid's learning and the way their brain is actually functioning. I'm thinking more about this kind, and Fumiko maybe to some extent, although Fumiko's an imager, but thinking about some of the socio-emotional factors that are involved. And yeah, la earlier this week we were at a meeting talking and presenting what we were doing, and I said, you know, when Mary Lou and I are going back and forth on this, I'm, we're arguing over somebody who is having some kind of a difficulty, and I'd say, well, 
that's uh, because of their, the, these emotional factors. And she'd say, no, the reason they have those emotional factors is because of the way their brain is wired and the way their brain's working. And I'd say, yeah, but that had to do with their attachment to their mother when they were little. And she says, yeah, but the reason they had trouble attaching to their mother was because of these circuits and the way that they're working. And I think it's together we're both right, and it really adds a lot to what we're doing. So the other thing that we think is unique in what we're doing is we're calling this translational. When you talk about translational research often in medicine being bench to bedside, we're talking in this case about bench to classroom. We're saying what we're learning in the lab about how kids learn and how they don't and how they might have difficulties learning is something that we then share with the parents and share with the teachers and measure outcomes to say, are we really changing how these kids are doing? Are we making a difference? And are the teachers implementing the changes that we're talking about with fidelity? So we have this meeting and the teachers go, yeah, yeah, oh man, that's amazing, that's really good. But they go back and do things the same way because it's comfortable to them. That yeah, I don't know that that happens, but we need to have a way to measure whether that's actually so. Because then we feed that back to the phenotype to say, did that phenotype, this subtype, this distinct way that this child had of doing things, did that actually lead to something that changed and improved their outcomes? So Mary Lou kind of leads it off in looking at these changes. As you might know, learning to read involves several, at least three, but many more parts of the brain that need to, in an intercorrected, connected way, learn to read. That's why for things like motor function, you know, playing a sport, it's not that complicated. But for reading, you need to take these unrelated parts of the brain, the cerebellum, the temporal parietal area, and, um, and the frontal lobes, and how they work together can lead in the way that this circuit is showing into a fairly complex pattern of what you have to do to learn how to read. And different people have different struggles with that. So I'm not going to go into detail on any of these subtypes, except to say that these are all th these are three kids from Armstrong School. All are there because they at least, quote, have dyslexia. But if you look at one group, um, one kid over here has nonverbal reasoning that's way high. These are a little lower. If we look at phonology, difficulty with phonics, now this kid doesn't have any trouble with phonics, but these, these two do have some. Or the phonological loop where you loop, where you link words together. One kid does pretty well with that. The others don't. Working memory, word retrieval, visual, spatial, social, emotional. You can see that there's different strengths and weaknesses in each of these kids. So you can't treat them all the same. For some kids, and I think I have a slide maybe, we also, I'll, I think I do, looking at the way these brain patterns work. And these show connections where you can see differences between the sides. Say on this first person with working memory, if you look at this blue and this blue, how different they are on working memory and insight. The visual phonological, you can see some differences here in these little red parts. And this is all somewhat research-based at this point, but it's, it's, it's emphasizing the way that we have different paths and patterns and ways of linking things together cognitively. And in that way, and this is not a real diagram, just a made up one saying, for a kid that has a lot of trouble with, with phonics, they might do very well with the Linda Mood Bell type program. But for a kid who doesn't, that kid that didn't have phonics problems, Linda Mood Bell isn't going to work for them. And I bet all of you in the field know that there are some kids that did great with Linda Mood Bell, and there are some kids that ju it just didn't take. And there's the same thing with Slingerland or ADHD or anxiety that could all be playing a role. And that's what we're working at trying to understand better so that we could use an app that Famico is developing to screen kids and then make more targeted interventions to make a difference in how these kids do. We're looking at outcome measurement that we do, we're doing at Armstrong, and I think we'll soon be starting at Chartwell and or talking with several other schools about doing that, where we gather information 
based on a, a number of different domains like grit and resilience, academic performance, attention, anxiety, and the phenotype-based measures, but also track my progress, how are you doing in school, to say, are we making a difference in what we're doing? And are there some kids that the phenotype that we shared makes a difference, but others where we need to go back to the drawing board and do a little more thinking about whether what we actually shared for that phenotype actually worked. The EBIT is this, this base that we have, is filled out by teachers and by parents. So we have that information together in one place. We have a way of looking at whether they're actually doing it, so we can say, hey, you're, uh, you're missing these. And we have different surveys that go to teachers and parents, and some are the same. So then we ask, what's the phenotype? What's the target? What's the intervention? What are the outcomes? We track the interventions. And teachers tell us that they're seeing changes and differences in what they're doing. You can see the number of things that teachers are saying were helpful to them, the modality that was involved. And here is their progress with a small number of students, but math and science, reading and writing, other skills that we've been able to measure up to this point, and their academic gains showing, uh, according to parents, they weren't doing as well, and, uh, but now they're, they're doing better. So I know that we were supposed to stop a few minutes ago, and so I will, but I'll be here for a minute or two. Thank you all for standing. <laughs>